Last month, it was my privilege to visit a magnificent site in Washington, D.C. It's called the Museum of the Bible. Just blocks, blocks away from the U.S. Capitol, this amazing museum is dedicated to encouraging people to engage with the scriptures. It features everything from ancient artifacts to modern virtual reality to highlight the history and impact of the Word of God. The man behind this magnificent effort is a founder and chairman. He's Steve Green, and Steve is here with us. And Steve, I want to thank you again for that glorious tour I had, and thank you for being here to show it to our audience. Uh, it's my pleasure, Pat, and I appreciate you coming to take a look at the museum. We were honored to have you. Well, you know, I was told that the most important thing in the last couple thousand years was the invention of printing, and the first printing was of the Gutenberg printing press, and the, what they did the Bible was the first books ever printed. Can you show us that press and how it works? I can. It was Life Magazine that came out with a publication in 2000, said the 100 most important events of a millennium. And number one was Gutenberg Prints the Bible. And this is a replica of the Gutenberg Press. Hello, my friends. Today we'll be giving one short demonstration on how to make a press at the Gutenberg Press. So we take the ink and we roll it out on the interchangeable and movable type, making sure all of the letters are coded. We take the paper that is held inside of the frisket and we put it down on top of the casket. Then we bury it underneath the platen, which will flatten, and we turn the lever to make the press, roll it back, roll back the casket, lift up the frisket, and our press is done. And so what's important to note is that it wasn't the Gutenberg Press that made the list of Life Magazine's 100 Most Important Events. It was the Gutenberg Prints of the Bible. That was the number one item that they came out with as the biggest impact for a millennium. Well, Steve, there's something that intrigued me. You had a fragment that looked like it was a, a modern text, a fairly modern, over top of an old Aramaic manuscript. And you had a light scanning process that you used to separate that Aramaic New Testament from a much later text. Can you tell us about that? That is referred to as the Codex Climaci Rescriptus. It's referred to as a codex because it was in a book form. Klamaki is what the top writing was. It was a writing uh, that's referred to as the Ladder of Divine Ascent that was written by a gentleman by the name of Klamaki. And it's referred to as a rescriptus because it was rewritten on some older text. And it is that older text that we were interested in because it was scripture in Aramaic. And with new scanning technology called multispectral imaging, uh, where you scan the document under different stops on the light spectrum, we can pull out the underlying text so that we have a better idea of what that original text was that was written over. And this particular document, the, what we refer to as the CCR for short, is understood to be the largest portion of Scripture in Aramaic, which would be the closest language to what Jesus spoke. This would be about 400 years after the life of Jesus. So it may be like the King James Version is today, but uh, this would be the largest portion of Scripture that is known in an Aramaic language. Steve, how did you get that? I mean, how, how do these things come into your hand? This was an interesting story. It was actually being sold by a college at Cambridge. Uh, it was during the year uh, 08 and 09 when the economy was struggling and their endowment was down and they were needing some resources. They had studied the document in the 40s, I believe, and uh, put it up for sale, put it up for auction at Christie's or Sotheby's, uh, and that's where uh, we were able to acquire it. And with the new scanning technology, are able to do even further research in what they had done in the 40s. Well, it was an incredible technological marvel. I was just so impressed. Well, I tell you something, when I was going through that Museum of the Bible, I was deeply moved in my spirit by an original painting you have, and we've seen so many copies of, of George Washington, who was leading in prayer at Valley Forge. And that, uh, I just can't tell you how that touched me. I had never seen the whole painting. We have that right around the corner for our, from where I'm standing. The artist's son is in possession of it, and he has it on loan uh, to us here at the museum. It is one of the most photographed uh, spots we have in the museum because of the iconic picture that it represents. There's something else that I saw that was so impressive. You actually had a representative of the, of the whole village of Nazareth where Jesus lived. People could actually experience that village and realize when Jesus walked on earth, 
this is what he's talking about. So can you tell us some of the features that you put into that marvelous uh, village that, that represents where Jesus himself lived? Yes, this is what we refer to as the city of Nazareth here at the Museum of the Bible, because what we're trying to do is recreate what the town would have been like that Jesus himself grew up into, because as you said, many of his teachings were based on uh, the culture that he lived in and was surrounded with. And, you know, what does winnowing wheat mean anyway? And so this is a way of trying to understand a little bit more of the parables and some of the teachings that Jesus taught, uh, where in this city, uh, we have a typical home, a carpenter shop, uh, an olive press, a wine press, uh, what a kitchen might look like. We have a synagogue, like what would have been built in Nazareth, where Jesus grew up. Um, so uh, the, the gentleman that, that was in charge of building the museum had built Nazareth Village in Nazareth, Israel, and had done a lot of study and research on what the city would have looked like. And we tried to recreate that. We had to squeeze it in a little bit and uh, make it a little bit smaller than what they've got there in Nazareth. But we wanted a person to feel like that they were walking into Nazareth and get a sense of what the town was like that Jesus himself grew up in. And so that helps them understand a little bit better the context and the culture uh, that Jesus is teaching from. Well, that was the magnificent effort. And you say the man who actually built the city, the little town in Nazareth was the one that came over and did this for you. It's a remarkable reproduction. That's right. So Kerry Summers is who built the museum. He had built the Nazareth village uh, in Nazareth, Israel, and was a great resource as, as not only here, but for the whole museum. Well, you just, you just, you, I walked into that place and it was so delightful. And I was suddenly living in the Bible. I mean, you've got the olive press and you've got all the things in the, and the sower goes out to sow and you've got the uh, various people doing what they did in, in the uh, New Testament. It's remarkable. Now, there's something else, Steve, that I was so impressed with. When Jesus was in Capernaum, he stood up and began to teach in the synagogue. And you showed me a reproduction of a synagogue. And the thing that impressed me is how tiny it was. Can you show us that? I can. That is uh, right here where uh, we, again, had to shrink it down from what it might have been like. But I suspect there was different synagogues that had a variety of different sizes and shapes. But a lot of research was done to try to determine what did a synagogue look like. And this is the best representation that we could come up with uh, based on all the research and the study of what it might have looked like. And so in the city of Nazareth, you may recall that Jesus, when he was starting his ministry, he came and he was teaching in a synagogue in Nazareth where he reads from the uh, scroll of Isaiah and, and he tells uh, the, the people of the city of Nazareth that this was fulfilled in their hearing, and they were trying to run him out on the rail, in essence. And um, But it was in a synagogue, very similar to what this would be, that Jesus would have spoken and uh, was common for the Jewish people in Israel. Well, you know, Steve, I'm used to churches now, mega churches that have 5,000, 10,000. And here is Jesus, the Son of God, and he's in a tiny little place like this. How many, that seat, that thing wouldn't seat more than 10 people, would it? 20 people? Yeah, if you sit on the different ledges, you might be able to sit uh, 25, 30 people, but it's a, it's a small facility. But that's what the Lord has showed. And, uh, you know, there was something else you mentioned that uh, I don't know if we could even show pictures of it, but you have an Isaiah scroll that uh, you actually put together and you've got the entire book of Isaiah. This, I understand, is the first manuscript in Hebrew of the whole book of Isaiah. Is that right? Yes. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, the only one that was complete scroll was the Great Isaiah Scroll. Uh, the original is housed in Israel. If you go there today, what you will see on display is a replica at the Shrine of the Book in Israel. We have a replica as well that is done on vellum, and it looks uh, very much like the original with the uh, stitching and all the uh, uh, deterioration being uh, repeated on the artifact. And it's an incredible artifact simply because it is it predates Christ by over 100 years, and it clearly in Isaiah 53 is pointing to Christ, predicting his coming. And there are five writers in the New Testament that are saying Jesus was fulfilling Isaiah 53. One of those is Luke that is telling us 
at the Last Supper, Jesus says, I must fulfill what was written about me. He was numbered with the transgressors. And he is quoting Isaiah 53. So the great Isaiah scroll is an incredible artifact, and it tells an incredible story of the validity of the scripture that we love and that we cherish and that we're celebrating here at Museum of the Bible. You actually raised the whole floor of a building. You've got 430,000 square feet. <laughs> How did you accomplish that? I mean, you literally lifted the whole floor up in the air and put something underneath it. How did you do it? We, we engaged Clark Construction, one of the largest in the country, and uh, this was one of the more complicated projects they said that they had ever worked on. We had to take out every other floor of this building. We added two floors on top of this building. We took an expansion of the building. We tore it all the way down, and we dug down and added a, a, a basement floor underneath the expansion that we, we took all the way down. Uh, and we added one floor on top of the adjacent office building uh, while it was being operated uh, or being occupied. So uh, this was an extremely complex project. Uh, the, the construction firm, uh, Clark, did a phenomenal job. It was done in time, and uh, we uh, owe them a great debt of gratitude because of the ex exceptional work uh, that they did, um, and it's, it turned out phenomenal. We're, we're very pleased with the, the job that they did. Well, how big is the Museum of the Bible? It is an enormous pr property. Can you tell us about the scope of it? The Museum of the Bible is 430,000 square feet, which includes a restaurant and a banquet hall, and we have space for the Israel Antiquity Authority, and the Vatican has space in here. We look at the Bible in three ways, its history, its impact, and its narrative. But as I have said time and time again, there is no building that can contain this book story. This is literally scratching the surface. One example that I use is that we have a New Testament theater where we tell the New Testament and we have 11 minutes to tell the whole New Testament story. Everybody likes me letting their pastor know it can be done, but we have 11 minutes. So literally, not only there, but in all areas of this museum, we are scratching the surface because this book is such an incredible book that has such an incredible story that we are literally just scratching the surface of its story. Well, I, I've got to say that I was just completely overwhelmed with what you did. It's it's so amazing uh, the, as you go through it. And ladies and gentlemen, I, I can't tell you as we just hear, it's, it's words fail me to describe the magnificence of this uh, Museum of the Bible. Steve, is there one favorite exhibit that you'd like to go back to over and over again as you see it? One of the, the favorites I would have is basically a Disney-esque ride. Uh, on our impact floor, we will take a person and we will fly them through Washington, D.C., showing them where scripture is engraved on monuments throughout the city. There's about 13 spots. We don't have time to go to all of them because uh, the, you, people would get sick on the ride. Uh, but we're, you get the sensation of flying through D.C., and we show you how that scripture is all over this city. Mm -hmm. This book has had an impact on our world. It's had an impact on our nation and it shows up right here in Washington, D.C. So that in itself is fun. It's an enjoyable ride, but it also is telling a powerful story of how this book has had an impact uh, even here in Washington, D.C. Steve, there's one thing I want to point out that struck me, and I know it's just a little thing, but you had a group of rocks when David came up against Goliath, and he said he ran for it, and he picked up some smooth stones and stuck them in his little pouch, and then he took it and slung a sling and hit the thing. And I thought it was a flat stone until you showed me the kind of projectile. It was like like a, 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 a big hand grenade. <laughs> and, and this is what hit Goliath in the head. I, I understand you, you aren't able to show those things on television, but I was so impressed with it. It wasn't a flat stone. It was a big rock when he hit Goliath with it. Is that correct? Yeah, when you see these rocks, uh, these stones, you see it's, uh, you know, some, some size about between the size of a golf ball and a baseball. It's a good sized stone. And that is in the space where the Israeli, Israel Antiquity Authority has their own space here. They have artifacts uh, that have an incredible story. The first time I understand that Israel has had an exhibit, a permanent exhibit outside uh, Israel. And a part of that exhibit are these stones that uh, give you a better sense of uh, the damage that could be done if you're skillful at a slingshot, and obviously David was. I just, as I say, words fail me to describe my sense of uh, 
of wonder at what you and your family have put together. You're the chairman of, uh, of Hobby Lobby and you, you've got an enormous amount on you, but this is a magnificent accomplishment. And we want to tell our audience how they can get in touch with you and how they can, uh, is the museum open to the public uh, during the week? And if so, can you tell me just real quickly what time it's available? Museum is open every day from uh, five, uh, 10 o'clock until five o'clock. Uh, if there are members, they can get in at nine and uh, we're open year round. We invite people to come. They can get more information on our website, museumofthebible.org uh, and order tickets online. We uh, invite people to come and, and enjoy their experience. Uh, one of the common comments I get is it exceeded our expectations. And uh, we would hope that as uh, people come and visit, that they will see that their expectations are exceeded as well. Well, I tell you, I, I consider myself a student of the Bible. I teach it and I read it and I pray about it and, and I'm, I'm writing books about it. But at the same time, I, I just was so impressed with what you have done. And I commend you for that. And I thank you for this quick tour. I wish we had hours to show, but people can come. And it's right in the heart of Washington, D.C., not too far from the nation's capital, not too far from the, the train station, the Museum of the Bible. Whatever you can do, folks, find time to see it. And Steve, thank you, my brother. You are a wonderful host. God bless you, and I appreciate this so much. Thank you, Pat. I'm honored to be here, and uh, thank you for coming and seeing the museum.